Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Today is a self-improvement Friday and we're doing something special. We're doing highly interactive self-improvement Friday. Uh, you know, this meetup attracts really amazing people. And this is an opportunity of people to share their favorite self-help book. I'm defining self-help very broadly. So any book that has really helped you in your life, you can talk about that. You can talk up to, you know, two to five minutes on the book, but keep it focused on books that have, have transformed your life, you know, have, have made your life better. So the rules are the same as always. We've got these four rules that we've used for five years now. First rule, raise your hand either in Zoom or you can type exclamation mark in chat in order to speak. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. So those, those are the rules. So who would like to get things started? And this is actually very good because you're going to be able to talk about the book you like, you know, talk about why, why you like it. And then you will get tons of recommendations and then we'll be able to, we'll actually go ahead and discuss it. So go ahead. Don't, don't be shy. Get, 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 let's get started. Who would like to go first? Max, go ahead. Okay. Um, Hopefully I can do more than one round because I do this thing where I read 52 books a year. And like last year I read, I read 67 books. So okay. I have a few that really like motivate me. I guess I'll start off with the lightest one and the most like direct one I feel, The Little Prince. Mm -hmm. um, it was originally a French fairy tale, I mean a French little book for children. It's like the concept is very simple. It's about this boy from this tiny planet. and He has like a tiny flower on the planet. And then he wants to go to other planets to see like what is in the universe. And it ends up like with him on earth and he's talking to this astronaut and telling the things about it. I guess um, there's a few things in it, but it just teaches you about appreciating the things that you have. It, it has a very basic concept about how like nothing is special really unless you make it special. Cause that's like his flower. Um, it's just one part that really moved me. And then he said, um, this flower, I thought it was different but um, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of roses just like this flower. And at first he thought his flower wasn't unique, but then he realized that like these other flowers, he had not like protected it. He had not like made the little shield for it. He had not like invested in it. And then he loved his own flower so much. He said, my one little flower is worth more than all the flowers on this whole planet. So like he, um, yeah, so it just, it, it teaches me a lot about like family, about friendship, about like the things you commit to and like by you committing, I don't know who said it, but they said a man is worked upon by what he works on. So mm -hmm. same thing by like what you invest in, I think that thing invests in you. So things can become special just by like you making them special kind of, and then you have to hold those things dear. Wonderful. Uh, it, uh, it was Little Prince folks. So um, folks, after you're uh, done talking, go ahead and put the name of the book and the author in the yeah. uh, chat so people can follow up with that. All right. So next up is going to be Ray, Jyoti, Andrew, Kevin, and Sumant. Ray. Ray, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Shrikant. The, the book I have is by Eckhart Tolle. Uh, the title is A New Earth Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. Uh, this is a book that has helped me very much with my self-improvement. I actually have three copies of this book. I have one at home and I was bringing it to work every day. So I bought a second copy for work and I like it so much whenever I have free time, I bought a third copy for my briefcase. <laughs> so this, uh, this is the only book I have three copies of, and I'll be mindful of my time. 
Um, so Eckhart really focuses about being in the present moment. And Eckhart really talks about, um, in terms of her minds, it's not an event that's happening that may uh, create struggle or drama. It's her reaction to the event. And to give you a, an example is if a car alarm goes off at two in the morning, I can choose to become very, very upset and, and mad and belligerent and confused and I'm all, all these different thoughts but it's not the car alarm. So he really makes us focus on her thoughts in terms of looking at her reactions and unconscious and uh, conscious thinking is really a main theme throughout the book. In the first chapter, he talks about um, looking at major religions and breaking down misconceptions. In the second chapter, he moves to the structure of the ego, that voice in her head and how that voice can be very, very dysfunctional and cause us a lot of chaos. And he compares it to um, animal species and how they may not have this same sort of dysfunctional thinking. He talks about two ducks in a pond and having a confrontation and the ducks collide. And afterwards, the ducks just flap their wings and get that energy and then they go their own ways where the human mind may say, how could that person do that to me? Why would he or she come so close and so forth? So he has a way of looking in and again, questioning where are our thoughts arising? Why do we uh, think the way we do? The other main uh, point in this book that I picked up on is Eckhart talks about something called the pain body, which is an accumulation of prior uh, past events that we perceive as pain, and that's collected within us. So when something happens, like the car alarm going off at two in the morning, that may trigger previous pains that I've stored in my body co collectively throughout my, my lifetime. So again, this is just something that he brings up. Um, I like this book, especially in relation to some of the other authors that I've studied through. I'm new, newly part to this, newly part of this philosophy group, like Jordan Peterson, in terms of why do we do actions the way we do. And I feel that Eckhart provides um, sort of a reasoning and an explanation that really speaks to me. Um, again, the pain body is a big thing. Uh, Eckhart feels that when you're in flow, when, you, when you're in harmony with life, when you're exploring nature, um, that uh, coincidences, serendipitous events seem to, uh, to come and manifest in, into your life. I must say, as I'm down to my last minute, there is some religion that uh, he contacts in this book. So if that's not your, your thing, that may put you off. I feel that it's not an excessive amount of uh, quotations that he refers to, um, but I, I did want to, to point that out in, in the book. So again, a, a book that's really touched me and uh, one that's had a big impact for my life. So thank you for letting me share. Wonderful, thank you, Ray. And I like the idea of having access to the book that you love all the time. So I have a li large library um, and what I realized that I can't carry all my books with me, which I don't like. So I have, you know, all, all the books that I really care about, I have here and in my library. That's my shortcut for, for doing that. But uh, thank you. Folks, uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark to share your favorite book. We'd like to hear from all, if not most of you. Um, so let's go with, it's, it's going to be Jyoti, Andrew, Kevin, Sumanth, Tom and Dave next. Jyoti. And folks, okay. time. you have up to five minutes. So take, take your time. <laughs> take your time, five minutes. It, I might be short, it might be shorter than five minutes. Um, my book is a little different. It may not be a self-help book per se, but it gave me something to think about and things that I was already doing. It gave me a voice. So I'm gonna talk about the David Brooks book, The Second Mountain. I'm an um, ardent fan of David Brooks. I've been reading his New York Times articles on wisdom and his essays. And I think he, he thinks very deeply 
and he is contrary to Western culture's way of thinking. He's more into in-depth individual spiritual thinking. So having said that, uh, even jo Jordan Peterson says that I'm not a pundit, I'm not a guru. People like my lectures, they like my writing and because they have what I'm telling them, but they don't have words to articulate. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt about David Brooks. I said, oh gosh, yes, yes, yes. It touches my heart because it's there, but I don't know how to express that way. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, to ha having said that, he talks about those people who are always walking around with joy and with the glow on their face. And he often wondered why they were so tranquil in their life. And he did some work on those people and he studied their journeys in life. It was not because they were not stressed out, they were not exhausted, but they dealt with the situation the way it should have been dealt with at that time. And I am not so worse like the other people who have, who have read uh, their, I mean, who have related to their stories, but I'm going to just read a couple of paragraphs. Mm -hmm, sure. Because I read this book a while ago. So you, have, you just bear with me. Mm -hmm. Now he says, they're the kind of people who are tranquil, delighted by simple pleasures and grateful for the large ones. These people are not perfect. They get exhausted and stressed. They make errors in judgment, but they live for others. And that's the one that got me. They live for others and not for themselves. They, are made un uh, they have made unshakable commitments to family, a cause and a community or a faith. They know why they put on this earth. They were put on this earth and community and they derive a deep satisfaction from doing what they have been called to do. Life isn't easy for these people. They have taken on burdens of others, but they have a serenity about them, a settled resolve. They are interested in you, make you feel cherished and known and take delight in your good. When you meet these people, you realize the joy is not just a feeling, it can be an outlook. These are temporary highs we are all get after we win some victory. And then there is also this kind of permanent joy that animates people who are not obsessed with themselves, but have given themselves away, which is our Indian philosophy. You just don't, don't get obsessed with just who you are, what you can do, but be useful and helpful for others. So that got me too. I often find that their life has what I think of as two mountains shape. They got out of school, began their career, or started a family, and identified, identified the mountain they thought they were meant to climb. I'm going to be a cop, a doctor, an entrepreneur, what have you. On first mountain, we all have to perform certain life tasks, establish an identity separate from our parents, cultivate our talents, build a secure ego and try to make a mark in the world. People climbing that first mountain spend a lot of time thinking about reputation management. They're always keeping score. How do I measure up? Where do I rank? As a psychologist, Jim Harley puts it at the stage, we have a tendency to think I'm what the world has endorsed me for. The goal of, uh, on that moment are normal goals that our culture endorses to be success, to be well thought of, to get invited into the right social circle and to experience personal happiness. It's all the normal stuff, nice home, nice family, nice vacations, good food, good friends, and so on. Then something happens. Some people get to the top of the first mountain, taste success and find it very unsatisfactory. In this, uh, is there all there is to it? They wonder, they sense there must be a deeper journey they can take. Other people get knocked off the mountain by some failure. Something happens to their career, their family or their reputation. Suddenly, life doesn't look like a study as an up the mountain of success. It has a different and more disappointing shape. For all others, something unexpected happens that knocks them crossways. The death of a child, 
a cancer scare, a struggle with addiction, some life altering tragedy, that was not part of the original plan. Whatever the cause, these people are no longer on the mountain. They are down in the valley of bewilderment or suffering. This can happen at any stage and at any age, by the way, from eight to 85 and beyond. It's never too early or too late to get knocked off your first mountain. These seasons of suffering have a way of exposing the deepest parts of ourselves and reminding us that we are not the people we thought we were. People in the valley have been broken open. They have been reminded that they are not just the parts of themselves that they put on display. There is another layer to them and they have been neglecting a substrate where the dark wounds and the more powerful yearning live. So this is whole, this is just to let you know that how the journey transits from mountain one to mountain two, and then somewhere along the line, you have a higher calling. And then you say, what am I doing? Like uh, Louis um, Sullivan says, what is this bank account for? Who am I? What am I doing for others? And that's essentially what this book is all about. Wonderful. What can you do? It's a commitment to your family. Don't run away from your family if, if somebody is sick. Take care of them and sacrifice. And which is a very foreign concept in America, I have to say. So that's why I like this book. You wanted to know why I like this. Yes. This is the reason. Wonderful, Jyoti. That, that, was, that was great. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you. So this is this is turning out to be an amazing meetup, you know, just having everybody talk about their favorite book. I think this is this is going to be good. Uh, next up is going to be Andrew and Kevin. Andrew. Okay, hi everybody. This is a book I'm recommending. It's called The Power of Now. Eckhart Tolle and, and Max obviously is a fan of his. And uh, there's a, a lot in here, but I just just a um, couple of things um, that I think were really helpful uh, to me. And that is the, I think the fact that we can really get too caught up in our own thoughts and get too caught up in, in thinking and looking for, uh, I guess for me, it would be looking for the technical, uh, looking for the technical reason for why things are why we might be believing things or how can we get out of certain mental situations. And uh, so his thing is that it's very easy for us to identify, create an identity to our thoughts. You know, this is like how I, what I think and what I believe, you know, that constitutes a big part of me. And sometimes that can be uh, uh, very fatiguing because, um, you're just getting deep. You're just, you think the answer is all in thinking. And I think this is particularly relevant to our, to this group, because I know, I think, uh, speaking for myself, and I think others that are attracted to your group is we're interested in, you know, things like logic, cognitive science, evolution. Um, those are very appealing. And those are all about like an answer based on logic and science. And uh, sometimes that can only get you so far and it could, it, could, uh, it could trip you up. So this is a helpful reminder, like, you know what? Don't get, uh, you gotta take a break from that basically. So that's, that's what I have. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, you know, Mindfulness is a very persistent interest in this group. Um, so we did this entire uh, series on, on uh, mindfulness uh, with amazing people leading, uh, leading the series. And it's a theme that we keep uh, coming back to. So thank you, um, Andrew. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin. Kevin. Thank you, Svanka. Uh, oh, is my voice okay? Yes. Sometimes it's low, eh? Okay. Yeah, my book is an uh, old book, 
is uh, you know two some years ago it still makes sense to find that one um it's called do the jin uh it's uh, i seen the one link the introduction and the second link is uh, this guy is translate uh, based western understanding mm -hmm. that's uh, pretty pretty good um the uh, this though 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 the jin mostly talk the though so what is Do? It's one yin and one yang. That's called Do. It's a, we see the one coin two side. This self is a Do. The self contain. It's uh, from days of two knees. It's from one knees to two knees, right? And the basic duality yin and yang that's uh, uh, constitutes the regime of a co uh, cosmic course. In English, we can paraphrase uh, it like with though there's one knees, with one knees, there's two knees. With two knees, you can generate three knees and so on. That's the, the old days of philosophy. Um, the, these moments coexist and co-dependent. Uh, they don't represent the evolution of history, good or bad, it's coexist. This when we see something good, another side possible makes sense too. If we let's see even further, we see the heaven evil. Maybe heaven side have something a little bit. You see the um, yin and yaw. In the black side have a little bit of dot is white. That's meaning maybe in the heaven a little bit evil. Another side, in the evil side, you look at how little bit black. That means something coexist. Um, another concept they see the transform of things. It's let's for example butter butterfly. The life cycle butterfly it includes the process called the matter of, of um, metamorphosis. Yes, where each butterfly goes this four stage: egg, larva, then pupa. They finally turn to adult butterfly. That means for they talk about the death and the life, we just transform different state. Um, one thing I'm going to send you another link. That's old days. Seeing the our child, uh, I was child. We learned it's called. Uh, I'm going to see the link. You can do it at the same time. It's uh, another story. They see the one guy uh, lost his horse. He said, perhaps it's not too bad. It's for to be placed. Then some days come back, this horse. The horse, he said, oh, that's maybe, you know, not that good. And days later, he broken his leg because horse. That means something looks as good, potential has something bad. If something bad, potential is good. So I'm going to stop here. Hopefully <laughs> you enjoy. That's the first that I would say uh, book. Uh, I, I like. Wonderful. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, one of the things I do want to do is to look at the Chinese thought. Um, I'm hoping to do something on Indian thought and Chinese thought at a very deep level. Um, my friend uh, Yasuhiko, who was here, you know, he's a very amazing guy. You know, he's uh, born and brought up in Japan, spent three, three years in India. He's just translated Dao De Jing. Uh, he's also very deep into uh, kind of continental philosophy as well as founding fathers. It's like he's his man of man of the world, if you would want to say. Uh, so I, I look forward to exploring these ideas because their emphasis, you know, uh, of Indian ideas or Chinese ideas are very different than the Western ideas. So it expands your range uh, of ideas and this idea of you know balance between yin and yang is definitely definitely a core idea of of uh, china uh, thank you kevin next up is sumanth tom and dave if anybody else wants to line up to talk about the book uh, their favorite book please do so i encourage you to do so that you'll get more value out of the meetup if you do so sumanth okay my favorite book is a very classic silver book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, I read this, like it was gifted to me in my first internship. Uh, 
21 years back. And over the years, I've read this maybe more than 50 times. Uh, and every time I read this book, it, gives, it brings more value and it speaks to you in a different way. Uh, but the core ideas, the seven core ideas of that book, uh, which are about the first three ideas are about something called as private victory. And on top of that, we have public victory. And this is just like dealing with the people and dealing with the... Uh, Sumant, could you speak a little bit loudly or uh, sure. raise the volume? Okay. Uh, let me change my mic. Is it better? Much better. Okay. So the, the private victory ideas are things like being proactive, uh, first thing first, and begin with the end in mind. Those are the things which allows you to be self-sufficient. And, and the public victory is the idea of uh, things like how to deal with other people. So we have ideas like think win-win, synergize, uh, seek first to understand before being understood. And the last idea is the sharpen the sword, uh, which is about trying to uh, increase your value or do things which helps you become a better person. So this is quite a very famous book. So I'm sure most of you have read this. But along with Seven Habits, the other book which I really like is As a Man Thinketh. It's a very short book, only like 30 pages. And uh, the value it brings is like, you are what- you uh, Suman, could you thing. again speak up a little bit? Okay, sure. Uh, so the other one is I like is As a Man Thinketh, mm -hmm. which is a very short book. It's less than 20 pages, 30 pages. And it was published like 100 years back. And the whole gist of the book is like, you are pretty much what you think. It's not like what you did in the past or what you're going to do in the future. It's what is the constant thought you always have. So... I really like this because it lets you really find out what you're thinking every time. Like it gives you a check. And yeah, and it has helped me a lot, both of these books. So, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sumant. Appreciate you, that. And, and welcome to the meetup. Uh, next up is going to be Tom. Hello, everybody. And uh, my favorite book, my favorite uh, self-help book is Goals, written by Brian Tracy. I just typed the uh, title and the author in the comments below. Um, I read the book about 10, 15 years ago, and it came at the right time in my life. And uh, it's important to me because I find that goals are, for all of us, to one degree or another, at the center of our lives. You know, we get up every day and uh, we go about doing our things, but most of the time, these are some, some goals. Why I like the book? I like the book because it is, it provides about one third of the book, provides concepts, logic, and reasoning. Second, it's easy to read uh, and, and understand. You know, sometimes you read a book and you get entangled in the reasoning of the author, trying to figure out what he or she trying to communicate, but this one is, is flowing very easily and and uh, you just want to continue to read it. And third, it also provides very doable, practical, down-to-earth advice, very easy to uh, to follow. And, and I found the book to be divided pretty much in two parts. So in the first part, the author provides a context, <clears throat> why goals are important in our lives, and also how to set them realistically. He basically says, look, uh, you can get in your, into your car, but if you don't have an objective, a goal that you're striving for, if someone's looking at how you go about driving your car, you're just driving in circles without any purpose or goal or aim. Um, so that was very, uh, very powerful. So first he explained, uh, explains that we all have potentials in us that oftentimes we find is unrealized and we feel fulfilled when we go about fulfilling that potential, striving towards being our better and best. 
Uh, he also talks about taking responsibility in our lives. And, and that was, that sounded uh, very intriguing because he pointed out so many of us start to blame, you know, our parents, our teachers, the government, our neighbor, the spouse, you name it, instead of really focusing and taking charge of your life, you know, yourself. And in that context space, he talks about clarifying your, your values. In other words, he says, hey, decide what's really important to you. If you have to make important decision in your life, say about your health, your children, your wife, your uh, health, your career, which would go first, second, third, and so on, because these, in essence, will dictate uh, your choices and, and your, uh, how you go about accomplishing those goals. So that's part one. And part two, he actually talks about a practical way to approach uh, those goals and, and how to achieve them. So he talks about uh, assessing where you are in relationship to your goals. Secondly, he talks about removing any roadblocks, roadblocks and, and uh, becoming pretty much an expert in your field. You know, if you're good, you succeed more, you feel good about yourself, you start to thrive, you become better and better. Further, he talks about associating with the right people, using your time well. Uh, <clears throat> he talks about reviewing your goals daily, visualizing them and using your subconscious to charge your uh, <clears throat> emotional side to be excited and passionate about your goals, <clears throat> excuse me. And lastly, he talks about being flexible, using your creativity and being persistent, you know, not, not losing the excitement and passion for your goals, but, but persisting. And, and uh, a quote that uh, I remember from that part is, he says, persistence to the character is like a carbon to the steel. <clears throat> you become very tough, and, and uh, uh, effective and, and successful. So summing it up, I like it because this book is practical. It doesn't provide a lot of, it actually doesn't have any fluff, but it provides doable practical steps. And I think it's realistic. He's not somewhere out there in the clouds uh, talking about some difficult to achieve ideas, but he's really grounded and, and practical in his approach. And he's supportive to to the readers as well. Thank you. Wonderful, Tom. That that was a great great review with a lot of details. So it was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank uh, next up is going to be Dave, Linda, Donna, and Jack. Dave, go ahead. Thanks, Rikant. I think this has been a great idea so far. Uh, I was thinking about this because I've read a lot of self help books. Uh, I went through a divorce in the early 1990s and about a year of life is not worth living phase. And uh, a couple authors I really dwelled on then were uh, Robert Fulgen, the All I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten series, uh, three or four very good books, and also Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled. I read that and about five or six other books by him. They're just marvelous. But I decided the one I want to talk about tonight is older. I'm okay, you're okay. That uh, you may not even heard of, but it was written in 1967, according to uh, Google. And I think it was won an award in 1972. The author is Harris. I'll put this all in chat. But it talks about transactional analysis. And there's a model of parent, adult, and child, PAC, to analyze a transaction between two people. And of course, a common transaction might be your boss at work. He's going to talk from the parent phase to you as a child phase, talking down to you about what I want you to do. And a lot of times, sometimes you'll find out even in a, in a relationship with a friend, you find out somebody's talking down to you. And you realize they're talking to you as if you're a child and they're the parent. And that's an unhealthy relationship, of course. Uh, they talk about the most healthy relationship, of course, is adult to adult. That's the uh, analytical uh, reasoning uh, conversation. Um, but a couple of interesting things I remember, and it's you know, like been 50 years ago since I read the darn thing. But the parent phase, a lot of times we're just turning on a recording in our brain. I remember my brother-in-law 
he he'd get upset and he'd say something and he, it would just be a phrase and i would swear it's something his father said because it was not vocabulary that he ever used so it's interesting how our brain works and the other comment i'd make at this point is the child phase a lot of us think well we're adults now so why would we worry about our child but that's where a lot of our emotions reside and uh that was part of my problem going through uh the self-help area or phase was my self-esteem and i remember doing a guided imagery and ending up in a brook holding little david over my shoulder saying, you know, it's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. And a lot of us don't realize that that child is inside of all of us. And in fact, a lot of times, you know, if we want to do something with our wife, we may get real childish and say, hey, let's go out and have fun. You know, we're not doing anything reasonable or intelligent. We're just going to go, you know, out to dinner or whatever. Uh, and the other part of it I would mention is that there's a four area of a model uh, in parts of a graph, but the part of it that's I'm okay, you're okay, is a healthy relationship. We're equal and we're both doing fine. Then it's the I'm okay, you're not okay. And that's the similar to the parent-child thing that I'm gonna talk down to you. I don't think you're my equal. Another opposite side is you're okay, I'm not okay. And that's a very sad state of affairs that, you know, I'm a, I'm a bad person. And of course, then the following corner is I'm not okay and you're not okay, which I understand is nihilism. That's, you know, nobody's any good. And that's a very poor uh, view of the world. But uh, I just love self-help stuff. It's been a while since I read any. Uh, but like I said, this is a, a great discussion tonight. Thanks very much for everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. Uh, next up is going to be Linda, Donna, Jack, and Eileen. Linda. Hi, Srikan. Uh, I'm going to talk about a popular Christian book. I hope I'm not going to ban after this. Uh, you are welcome to talk about any book that you want, and uh, you're welcome to you know that th this is this is an open forum for for anybody. Religious, atheist, left, right. Uh, go ahead. So this book is the se second most best-selling book of all time. Uh, and I really admire the author because uh, he gave away 91% or probably even more uh, his income. Because especially the first sentence of the book uh, the book title is The Purpose Driven Life. And the first sentence of the book is, it's not about you. Your life is not about you. So uh, I'm just going to read a few quotes sure. from the book because I'm not very good at explaining. Uh, True humility is not thinking less about yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Forgiveness must be immediate, whether or not a person asks for it. Trust must be rebuilt over time. Trust requires a track record. Experience is not what happens to you. It is what you do with what happens to you. Don't waste your pain. Use it to help others. Other people are going to find healing in your wounds. Your greatest life message and your most effective ministry will come out of your deepest hurts. You weren't put on earth to be remembered. You were put here to prepare for eternity. That's a few quotes from the book. I really like the book. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Linda, I really appreciate it. Uh, next up, 
is going to be actually uh, on the theme of religion. Um, we are looking at a very interesting psychologist called Magda Arnold. Uh, she bases her work on Thomas Aquinas and it's very powerful. It's been a long time since I've read her, but her core idea is that your concept of self ideal is the thing that organizes your personality. And she has an entire theory of emotions based on appraisals of how emotions are connected with your self ideal, how they drive actions. Um, so it's a very deep work. And I have uh, you know, a great professor who spent a lot of time studying Magda Arnold uh, talking about that. So that's going to be on Sunday at uh, one o'clock. All right, next up is Donna, Jack, and Eileen. Donna. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So, and thank you for having this. I um, love all the books that have been mentioned, and I'm a self help book junkie. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of my favorite books that I just started to listen to is The Astonishing Power of Emotions, which is by Esther and Jerry Hicks. And, um, and I was introduced to Abraham, which is the group of spiritual beings that, that are channeled through Esther Hicks. And the, the big part of the book is focused on the law of attraction, which I'm a very strong believer in. And what I love about this book, which I have never listened to, is it goes deeper to into the other side in the law of allowing. And um, this book also does a wonderful job of just very of simplifying uh, the concept of law of attraction and law of allowing and in talking about upstream and downstream. So when our thoughts are going against the flow, those thoughts are going upstream, taking us away from the our thoughts that are manifested into the future downstream. The other thing that I love about this book, it, it focuses on just changing those thoughts so simply in a very little tiny way to move downstream. And what I can do is read a few um, quotes from, from the book. So Go ahead. There are three powerful universal laws that are of value for you to understand if you wish to guide your life deliberately. And the law of allowing is the last of, three of these. Just as your earthly law of gravity requires no practice, just consistently responds to all matter in a consistent way, neither does the law of attraction need practice. You do not have gravity instructors teaching how to avoid falling up because falling up instead of down is not an option or a problem. In the like manner, you need not to practice in order to cause the powerful law of attraction to respond to you in a consistent way. For it will bring things to you that match your vibration. And it will do so even in your ignorance of the law. The second law of the three powerful universal laws is the law of deliberate creation. By deliberately 
directing your attention and thoughts toward the outcome that you desire, you can be or do or have anything that you choose. The application of this powerful law has resulted in the manifestation of this magnificent planet upon which you live. And everything that you are able to see. In the same way that the non-physical source energy applied this law and through powerful focus created this environment that you call life on planet Earth, you are continuing to process the process of creation from your physical vantage point. And while these first two laws of extreme importance and your awareness of them is great value to you, to all that is, your understanding and application of this third law, the law of allowing, is really where your personal power lies. The law of attraction says the essence of that which is, is like unto itself is drawn. And what that means is, if I feel unappreciated because of circumstances that have recently occurred in my experience, the law of attraction cannot, cannot now surround me with people who appreciate me. That would defy the law of attraction. If you feel fat and unhappy about the way my body looks and feels, I cannot discover the process or state of mind that is necessary to achieve a good feeling, good looking body. That would defy the law of attraction. If I feel discouraged about my financial situation, it cannot improve. Improvement in the face of discouragement would defy the law of attraction. If I am angry because people have been taking advantage of me, lying to me, dishonoring me, and even defacing my property, no action that I can take can stop these, those unpleasant things from happening, for that would defy the law of attraction. The law of attraction simply and accurately reflects back to you in a myriad of ways, an accurate response to your vibrational output. In short, whatever is happening to you is a perfect vibrational match to the current vibration of your being. And the emotions that are present within you indicate that vibrational state of being. Once aware of the powerful law of attraction, many people make a conscious de decision to, do, to be more in control of their own thoughts, or they have come to understand the power of focusing thought. People attempt to control more effectively, focus their thoughts through a variety of methods, ranging from hypnosis, or an attempt to control unconscious thoughts, to meditations, affirmations, strong methods of mind control. But there is a much easier way of going about the deliberate creation of your own experience in fulfilling your intention for this joyous life experience. And that is an understanding in its application of the art of allowing. It is conscious, gentle guiding of your thoughts in a general direction of the things that you desire. And as you come to understand this powerful stream of life that we are explaining, and as you get a glimpse of the larger picture of who you really are, and most important, as you become convinced that your true work 
is to simply realign with who you really are. The art of allowing will become second nature to you. I can continue, but I don't know what my time. Wonderful. Uh, Donna, that was, that was great. And I think uh, the idea of reading out passages gives people the exact flavor uh, of the book so they can, they, can, they can pursue it. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. I do want to just add that I will tell you through my life, now one can say it's coincidence or not, but I'll give you an example. When I go shopping with my mother in the past, she'll say, I'm not going to find a jacket or I'm not going to find this. I'm not going to find that. So I tell her, well, of course you're not because you're walking in there and you're saying you're not going to find a jacket. I said, you can't go in there saying that. If you say that, it's never going to happen. And I go in saying that I'm going to find a jacket and it's going to be $20. I'm going to find a jacket for $20. And um, this is a bargain store, by the way. <laughs> but I go in there and I come out with, I think I came out with three jackets that day. But I had no doubt in my mind that I was going to come. I knew I was going in there to get a jacket for $20 and I came out. So Wonderful. for me, it's a very powerful um, Water. Thank you, Donna. You're next welcome. up, uh, next up is Jack, Eileen, Paul, and Max. Jack. Well, Donna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna jump off from your last thing because the, I think one of the most uh, important books for me was uh, the Power of Positive Thinking, and I know it's really old. And Dave, you mentioned a bunch of books that I had read. Um, the Road Less Traveled, I read that, and all I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. And I was an art teacher for 36 years in high school. We used to have a poster on the wall that said, everything I needed to know I learned in art class, which is, you know, share everything, you know, clean up after yourself, the same kind of stuff, which, which, is, uh, which is really good. And then I wanted to add, I'm okay, you're okay. If you've ever seen the movie Goodwill Hunting, there's a scene when Robin Williams pushes Matt Damon up against the wall in, 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 uh, in his office, you know, in, in Robin Williams' office. And right next to his, uh, Matt Damon's head is the book, I'm Okay, You're Okay. I mean, it's, it's really good. But for me, the, um, the power of positive thinking I had read a long time ago. And I got two teaching jobs because of that, I think. I mean, there's no 100% evidence that it really worked, but I know it did not hurt. And I think the positive energy that I was given up, I kept, as I was being interviewed by the, by the principal, I kept in my, in my head, visualizing him standing up, shaking my hand and saying, you got the job. And it worked two times for me. I then used it when I was a track coach and I was a track coach for 36 years. And I would have all the kids on the track team when we were watching one of our um, teammates, you know, high jump, especially the high jump and the hurdles because it's a very, those are two very tenuous events. It's so easy to maybe knock over the bar with your foot or your hand or something. And I would say to the kids, let's be positive. Let's give you know, our jumper positive energy. And a lot of times it really, really helped. So there's no proof, 100% proof, but for me, that, that book has been a big help in my life. So anyway, thanks for listening. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next up is Eileen, Paul, and Max. Folks, uh, if you'd like to share your favorite books, I encourage you to do that. Uh, you'll get more value out of the meetup by doing that because this is just the beginning and then we'll start discussing it. So please put your book on the table. Uh, next up is Eileen. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, it's Elle. Um, Elle. Shrikant, can you? Uh, yeah. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, what I wanted to share was something from notices from the American Mathematical Society. And it isn't a book, but it is how to proceed in mathematics. 
and it's by Garibaldi and Gordon. And this is what they share. Um, how to proceed in mathematics. And I think it could apply in about any field if you um, just transfer the field, if it's appropriate. Um, number one, work on hard problems. Um, choose, pro choose problems to work on that are hard problems. Um, they should feel familiar. Um, it's the famous people in the field um, that uh, may be there for personal growth. Um, let me skip to the next one. Um, secondly, do some whimsical math. Um, and thirdly, share your ideas. Uh, fourth, understand your colleagues' strengths. And fifth, try to find someone who knows something that you don't know who is willing to work with you on your problem. And uh, this came from um, the last public mathematics talk given by Warwick Delaunay before he succumbed unfortunately to cancer at the young age of 52. He spent most of his career working on classified mathematics first in Australia and later in the United States and his long list of publications and many collaborators attest to him having lived his professional life following this advice. And Wonderful. I personally liked um, Napoleon Hill's um, Think and Grow Rich. And I thought it would be not something I'd like because it would be very selfish, but there's something in there to learn. And thank you, Shikhan. Wonderful. Thanks, El. Uh, thank you. Uh... Wonderful. Let's see who's next. Uh, give me a second. Uh, next is going to be Paul, followed by Max and Dave. Paul. Yeah, um, I won't. I won't be too long. I I resonated with a lot of what a lot of people said, especially someone mentioned that this this group and a lot of people these days are. We're it's a it's a very smart group and there's a risk of just being too cognitive. So, and I fall into that category. And the book that is by my bedside um, that is most valuable to me right now is The Essential Rumi, The Essential Rumi. So that's because, and I, I the way I can present why that's important to me, well, Rumi was the poet from, I think he was born in, 1207, Turkish poet, Sufi tradition. Lots of people probably know about him because he's pretty popular these days. But um, uh, the table of contents of the essential Rumi kind of shows his breadth. So I'll show you, I'll just read something from, from the table of contents that this particular Coleman Barks, I think, this guy who put together this group, shows that it is not in unreasonable to call this a self-help book. The way I use it is just randomly open to any page. But um, let me read you some of the things that he writes about, Rumi wrote about. Um, these are the headings of the categories in the 28 themes. So the book is organized into themes because the, Rumi's poetry and writing is vast. It's not just poetry, it's stories. So, so to give you an example of themes, Bewilderment, I have five things to say. Emptiness and silence. Feeling separation, don't come near me. Controlling the desire, the body. How did you kill your rooster? That's a story, obviously. Being a lover. Art as flirtation with surrender. surrender. Wanting new silk harp strings. Union. The shake, how, having a teacher, recognizing elegance, your reasonable father. So you start to see a breadth here of, he's just so, sort of trying to grasp the essence of life. And I, I'll pause there and just say the thing that I gain from him is his being such a deep seeker. And that's what this group is. And that's what Srikant also represents to me. And, and you and everyone here is in this seeking mode. And um, 
to take the whole category of people who were more seekers in a mystical sense and think of them as different is a mistake. They were seeking a big picture meaning and uh, he transcended religion in, in many ways. He's recognized as sort of embracing all of the faiths and going beyond them really. There's this theme called Jesus poems because he wrote about Jesus, although he was a Sufi. Um, beginnings and endings, uh, being woven, wishing, majesty, evolutionarily evolutionary intelligence now that's probably that's coleman Barth's interpretation of a theme but i'll read one short poem and then i'll i'll stop the poem i want to read to illustrate is a uh, is called the guest house uh, do i still have time to read that Shrikant? please please go ahead okay um the guest house this being human is a guest house every morning a new arrival a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Wow. So that's my little roomy presentation. Thank you. Wow. Paul, that was very interesting. I have to, I have to start reading him. Uh, I, I, like, I, mean, I like minds like this. I like broad minds who take on everything. Yes. And do so in a very unassuming way, almost of a child saying, "Okay, what is this?" And you know, you you find that in people like Goethe, for example, is like that. Yes. There are there are there are a number of minds like this, but uh, not number. It's actually quite few, few people, but there are people across yeah. history. Like Leonardo is like that, mm. and what they do is that they have this kind of freshness that they bring. So they may be talking about something which is very familiar to you, but you look at it through new eyes. Yes. Uh, so, so wonderful. Thank you. I'm definitely going to read him. Thank you. Um, so folks, I'm going to give priority to people who have not spoken. You're welcome to do, do seconds, but we're going to give priority to people who are, who have not spoken before. So it's going to be Patricia, Max, and then Dave, Patricia. Hi, yes, thank you. And I wanted to just say thank you to Paul for the Rumi. Um, I love Rumi. Um, Dave for the reminders about all those good old fashioned self-help books. Uh, you brought to mind something that I had read several years ago by Charles Whittefield, um, The Child Within or, and The Gift to Myself, which is about the inner child and taking care of, of yourself. Um, but what I've actually was thinking about talking about was kind of turning this sideways a little bit um my favorite one of my favorite books and i quote it all the time is oh the places you'll go by dr seuss so if you don't mind me reading a little bit of that to kind of lighten please do up. please do okay we, this is this is a treat Rumi and dr seuss <laughs> Oh, the places you'll go, you'll be on your way up, you'll be seeing great sights, you'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights, you won't lag behind because you'll have the speed, you'll pass the whole gang, and you'll soon take the lead, wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best, wherever you go, you will top all the rest, except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say, but sadly it's true that bang ups and hang ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch and your old gang will fly you on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump. And the chances are then you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. 
You will come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darked. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you, go, should you turn left or right? Or right in three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find, for a mind maker upper to make up his mind. So I don't know whether you want me to continue, but I, it goes on to say, you know, that, you know, it's hard, you'll get confused, but you're going to keep trying and chances are you'll succeed. Um, yeah, so I think it's an important, it's a very um, light read, but it, my, my niece and nephew gave it to me when I graduated uh, from graduate school. And so it always brings tears to my eyes because I was an adult when they gave it to me and they were little children. But that was very excellent words of advice. No, absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's amazing. And I think the simplicity of it, see, again, like, you know, people uh, discount children's books. People discount fairy tales, but often they have the deepest themes. And Dr. Seuss is particularly uh, particularly brilliant at uh, at doing this. So, thank you, thank you, Patricia. Next up is going to be uh, Max, followed by Dave. Max. Um, yeah. So, a really big uh, book for me, and I think this book was actually the foundation of a lot of uh, kind of self help books. Is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? Um, Viktor Frankl was in a concentration camp and it's uh, and he started this thing called logotherapy which is meaning therapy so it's not like just so he felt like people suffered because they felt like they suffered and they didn't have any purpose to it no meaning to it, no meaning to it for instance i could be running for the bus and then i missed the bus and i'm thinking oh man now i'm wasting 15 minutes you know if only i would have been like one minute more and i'm really like i'm choosing to frame it in that certain way and there's like kind of no meaning to my suffering Whereas like if I miss the bus and I say, okay, I missed the bus, now I can use 15 minutes to catch up on this book that I want to read or, you know, I, I use 15 minutes to, you know, maybe go through a few emails and then there's like meaning to my suffering. Um, and so he felt, he felt like that's what helped him get through the concentration camp. And that was the difference between the people that made it and the people that didn't, the people that like subscribe meaning to the things that happened to them versus the people that felt like they were just a subject to this like um, kind of ambivalent and, you know, kind of nonsensical lashing of fate and suffering. So yeah, that book, and if you notice the kind of concepts behind it, it has like a lot of stoic roots to it, where it's like, you know, the framing of things, like you can always, you can't control, for instance, what happens to you, but you can always control your opinion about these things that happen to you. And no one can ever take that from you. Someone could like take you, torture you, beat you, but they couldn't make you see yourself in a certain way or they couldn't like make you they couldn't control your mind and your opinion about it or how you perceive reality so it's really empowering and like that's kind of like the foundation that i think a lot of self-help books kind of built up from wonderful and it just i mean it's just amazing personal example of what a person what a human being is capable of uh because like, you know, after you read something like that, you know, you look at yourself and say, what excuse do you have? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Because they, they, they are able to do something in such a, you know, in, in, in such a context. So wonderful. Dave, you're next. Yes, I said before, one of my favorite authors is Scott Peck. It's famous for the road less travel. This is called A Different Drum. And I want to share a short story that's very inspirational. I hope you can enjoy it. Just a couple of pages. Mm -hmm. There's a story, perhaps a myth, typical of mythical stories. It has many versions, also typical. The source, the version I am about to tell is obscure. I cannot remember whether I heard it or read it or where or when. Furthermore, I do not even know the distortions I myself have made in it. All I know is for certain is that this version came to me with the title. It is called The Rabbi's Gift. The story concerns a monastery that had fallen upon hard times. Once a great order, 
as a result of waves of anti-monastic persecution in the 17th and 18th centuries and the rise of secularism in the 19th, all its branch houses were lost and it had become decimated to the extent that there are only five months left in the decaying mother house, the abbot and four others. All those over 70 in age, clearly it was a dying order. In the deep woods surrounding the monastery, there was a little hut that a rabbi from a nearby town occasionally used for a hermitage. Through their many years of prayer and contemplation, the old monks had become a little, a bit psychic. So they would always sense when the rabbi was in his hermitage. The rabbi is in the woods, the rabbi is in the woods again, they would whisper to each other. As he agonized over the imminent death of his order, it occurred to the abbot at one such time to visit the hermitage and ask the rabbi if by some possible chance he could offer any advice that might save the monastery. The rabbi welcomed the abbot at his hut, but when the abbot explained his purpose of his visit, the abbot could only commiserate with him. I know how it is, he exclaimed. The spirit has gone out of the people. It is the same in my town. Almost no one comes to synagogue anymore. So the old abbot and the old rabbi wept together. Then they read parts of the Torah and quietly spoke of deep things. The time came when the abbot had to leave. They embraced each other. It has been a wonderful thing that we should meet after all these years, the abbot said. But I've still failed in my purpose for coming here. Is there nothing you can tell me, no piece of advice you can give me that would help me save my dying order? No, I am sorry, the rabbi, rabbi responded. I have no advice to give. The only thing I can tell you is that the Messiah is one of you. When the abbot returned to the monastery, his fellow monks gathered around him to ask, well, what did the rabbi say? He couldn't help, the abbot answered. We just wept and read the Torah together. The only thing he did say, just as I was leaving, it was something cryptic, was that the Messiah is one of us. I don't know what he meant. In the days and weeks and the months that followed, the old monks pondered this and wondered whether there was any possible significance to the rabbi's words. The Messiah is one of us. Could he possibly meet one of us monks here at the monastery? In that case, which one? Do you suppose he meant the abbot? Yes, if he meant anyone, he probably meant Father Abbot. He has been our leader for more than a generation. On the other hand, he might have meant Brother Thomas. Certainly Brother Thomas is a holy man. Everyone knows that Thomas is a man of light. Certainly he could not meant Brother Elred. Elred gets, gets crotchety at times. But come to think of it, even though he was a thorn in people's sides, when you look back at it, Elred is virtually always right, often very right. Maybe the rabbi did mean Brother Elred, but surely not Brother Philip. Philip is so passive, a real nobody. But then almost mysteriously, he has a gift for somehow always being there when you need him. He just magically appears at your side. Maybe Philip is the Messiah. Of course, the rab rabbi didn't mean me. He couldn't possibly have meant me. I'm just an ordinary person. Yet suppose he did. Suppose I am Messiah. Oh God, not me. I couldn't be that much for you, could I? As they contemplated in this manner, the old monks began to treat each other with extraordinary respect on the off chance that one of them might be the Messiah. And on and off chance that each monk himself might be the Messiah, they began to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. Because the forest in which it was situated was beautiful, it so happened that people still occasionally came to visit the monastery to picnic on its tiny lawn, to wander along some of its paths, even now and then to go 
into the dilapidated chapel to meditate. As they did so, without even being conscious of it, they sensed this aura of extraordinary respect that now began to surround the Bible monks and seemed to radiate from them and permeate the atmosphere of the place. There was something strangely attractive, even compelling about it. Hardly knowing why, they be began to came back to the monastery more frequently to picnic, to play, to pray. They began to bring their friends to show them this special place and their friends brought their friends. Then it happened that some of the younger men who came to visit the monastery started to talk more and more with the old monks. After a, while, after a while, one asked if he could join them, then another and another. So within a few years, the monastery had once again become a thriving order. And thanks to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. That was, that was wonderful.